Ah, look at here, it's Sir William Conley, the pretentious motherfucker with too much importance, who's made a career out of a couple of magic act gimmicks. For many years, he would wear this black, if you look, you can see, here's some pictures, here's a black uh, t-shirt, it looks kind of uh, scruffy, and then some black pants, uh, could be dark, some kind of dark shirt or pants, uh, sort of these loafy shoes. Now, here's Louis C.K. doing the same thing. He also wore this same thing for years. Um, it doesn't just happen to be their street clothes. That's that's in uh, plastic bags and hangers, and it's brought to the show, and it's, they put it on in the green room. So we're looking at a kind of magic trick. Uh, for whatever reason, this works. Uh, so you wear a lot of black. You wear um, un your sh clothes should look like they don't really fit you and they're a little too old. So this is actually the clown principle. You know, there's a reason why um, traditionally we had, you know, clowns have uh, oversized shoes and that's uh, and torn clothes. They're a little out of style. You know, there's a reason for that. And also red hair. Like, uh, look at fucking young ginger Louis C.K. Uh, anyway, that's, that, that's not what this is about. It's about this fucking Billy Conley. Um, although, I have to say something interesting. He has a custom-made shirt. Um, with a kind of tail on the back. I suppose if he bends over, it doesn't uh, pull up and give you butt crack, but for whatever reason, I find that a little bit interesting. You'll see that in a lot of his uh, stand-up. Hmm. Yeah, so anyway, that's kind of an example, though, of a magic trick. Um, so you don't have to have written anything funny. That's kind of funny in itself. But Mike David explains this very well. Uh, a lot of stand-up comedy is a magic trick. Um, it could also be likened to a hypnosis, a hypnotic stage show. So what happens if you get a bunch of people in a room and you use the right uh, beats, the right uh, pace of your voice? This is something, something, and this is a punchline. Am I right? And then the audience will laugh. Most people will start laughing. Now, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but if you're Billy Connolly, it's a big fucking gimmick. It's a big magic trick that he played on people for 30 to 40 years. And listen, I'm going to prove that out as we go along. But um, what I think happens, though, is that some, something has to do with the Glaswegian accent. Um, so you know maybe the Simpsons caught on to this with groundskeeper Willie Rowdy Roddy Piper, a Canadian who would do a sort of Glaswegian tone of voice. So there's something about Glaswegian accents that evokes laughs from the audience without anything needing to be funny. Um, Connolly, in particular, his stuff is not good. Dudes, if you look at this, I'm not going to put it on here, but if you want, just go ahead and look at transcripts. They are long, dull stories about what his friends did something funny or something stupid, but I think he becomes an asshole as he goes on. He gets lazy, realizes he doesn't actually need any kind of funny story. He can just bark something out and... If he uses that correct tone and then barks at the audience, they will laugh. A fucking person hole covers in the street. Uh, so another trick that Connolly does is self laughing. Oh, he's bad for self laughing, and he use he's very good at using this trick. So the joke isn't funny or is funny. It's neither here nor there. He will break out, burst out laughing, and it almost always works. Uh, it actually always worked until people started to catch on that it was a thing else he uses in his magic act, uh, which is subliminal suggestion. And this is fucking weird, because you'll see it in comment sections all over the internet. If you find a Billy Connolly video, you'll be amazed how many people will type in, uh, Billy Connolly, fucking brilliant. Billy Connolly, he is, oh, uh, this guy, I saw him in concert, he was fucking brilliant. And this is subliminal suggestion. He uses that phrase. Um, he'll have years where he doesn't do it as often, but you'll find stretches where everything is fucking brilliant. And he says it so often that fans just start so saying it. They'll say it about him. He's fucking brilliant, brilliant. One thing about Billy Connolly, that guy is brilliant. And at the moment, there's, there's a few favourites. There's, there's Brian Glover over there in the red one. He's a big man, but there he's there. And over there, there's Gloria Hunnifer's dog. He's in the back of a Harley Davidson number, which is brilliant. I love it. You don't get this anywhere else in the world. It's the Isle of Man TT. It's but once a year, and it's brilliant stuff. But he's not brilliant. His, his act is not brilliant. Although I suppose you could say he's a brilliant magician. 
He's able to make audiences laugh and think that he's brilliant without really any substance, any substantial jokes, without any craftsmanship outside of the magic tricks. Uh, I've mentioned before, actually one of my standards for who's terrible and who's a bad comedian, Connolly is highly overrated, and then he has he breaks another standard, which is he believes that he's entitled to it. Uh, and he's another one, it's quite interesting, who gets importance. Sir Billy Connolly, he, he's attributed importance. Uh, yeah, so in there's so that's where the, I make a comparison also to George Carlin, who is also attributed some uh, importance, even if it's for different reasons. But there's something else they have in common. Uh, they were just exactly the right age. And, you know, of course, in my videos, you know, I love to uh, uh, reference um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's work, The Outliers. Uh, but this is where it's true. He grew up in a time, uh, I have an old uncle who was telling me he did, knew nothing about folk music. Like, he did not play any instruments. He's like, yeah, that exact time, like, his neighbor was, like, in a, a hit recorded, like, they had a recording contract, folk music band, <laughs> was telling them that, like, he needed to hurry up and learn to play some drums so that they could hire him immediately in the folk music circuits. Yeah, this is, as well as comedy, so George Carlin uh, put on his hippie costume immediately. Cheech and Chong, who would uh, like Carlin, they mocked hippies until they realized there was such a powerful demand that you couldn't lose, and Connolly couldn't lose either. He was at an era where as soon as you could figure out how to play guitar, and as soon as you could figure out how to do comedy acts, you were in. You were in. And of course, he could rely on two saying shocking things on TV and or the telly, uh, which anyone, you know, there's something to be said about that too. Uh, if you came up in, if you were Howard Stern, it was easy to be a shock jock. You just had to go over the line. Um, likewise with Connolly, he was uh, one of the first to go over the line. He was known as Mr. Fuck. That's because this shocking guy said the word fuck. John Noakes, there's another one. He's late. He's delivering pizzas. The fucker. This is just the most amazing thing. And there's another, there's Bernard Cribbins. He's always late. Poor old Bernard, there he goes. Away you go, Bernard, you fucking last, you fucker. He was in the Wombles, of course, and that's what made it. And there's Vincent Price. Vincent Price is in that fiesta. He's going to be taking part later on. Brilliant man. I think that's the last time. I'm going to go and have a wee shot. Uh, so what happens, though, that's, what, what do you do when that does become acceptable and then every comedian can say fuck and shit and more than seven uh, forbidden words, right? So then you've lost that. So a lot of his was timing, was the right time, the right place, a Glaswegian accent that tricks Anglosphere people into believing that they've just heard a funny punchline and evokes laughter. He was attributed importance for just being a certain kind of time and place. Uh, and this fucking asshole thinks he's in totally entitled to all of it. Yeah, and so in reward for his uh, great success, uh, he uh, becomes a junkie, so he was. Uh, so he's also guilty of a lot of cocaine, being what was funny and still at a time, much like Robin Williams. When people, the, uh, most people in the audience didn't understand they were watching the drugs doing the work. Um, I think now people might have been might catch on to that, but at the time, so he was using you know uh, performance enhancing drugs. Um, and then uh, Mr. Connolly decided what he should do was become like that uh, fucking guy from the Who. And then he would do some uh, faggotry things with uh, young people. And uh, But this is where I think that he's a fucking asshole and he's a bad person. Uh, because he he invoked the, you know, this thing is a real problem with people uh, who are invoking um, trauma to excuse things. Uh, so what, what his thing is, he says, well, I was molested as a kid. So you see what happened is that I, that's when I started acting out. And that's, w and that's why I was on cocaine. Uh, not because I'm just a greedy, selfish uh, party boy, but because, um, you know, I was trying to, you know, so actually, he's the victim. He was actually, the vi actually, Connolly's not a predator, but he's the victim. Um, so that's his excuse. This man, what's going on with this? And he does this at two very significant things in his life. But in this case, he says his father was raping him from like the age of 10 to 15. You know, so that's why he was doing that certain behavior with uh, young men. So here's the thing. Um, I think that he's lying about this. It's pretty weird, like, no police ever showed up for this. Like, his father was never investigated. Nobody's ever heard of social workers 
or anybody investigating that he was raping his son for five years? And furthermore, uh, after this, Connolly will carry on talking about his father like he's, you know, like a comedy dad. And he, he, you know, typically like every other comedian, he's got a thing about how his dad acts like this and what his dad said to him. And then he, as he gets older, he, how he misses his, you know, his old dad and what it's like to um, have to, you know, take care of the old man, you know. So what the fuck? He raped you between the ages of 10 to 15. Really? Another thing he's guilty of, um, and I guess we could call it a trick, but he'll be in a dull place and then he'll just start uh, doing jokes from other comedians. Like he'll go, I just remembered, uh, have you ever heard of this comedian? And then he'll do, yeah, not cool, Billy Connolly. And then he'll self laugh at them for a while. So everyone else starts laughing. Like here's one here. All right, well, let's get back to how he's a one trick pony. Uh, yeah, he's a big magic trick, and one of the ways you could you could know that is by taking him out of stage performances and putting him in something like a sitcom. Well, they did. They tried to put him in Head of the Class. Uh, that was actually a popular TV show back in the 90s era. Uh, he took over from Howard Hesseman, and it did not go well. So, still convincing everyone that he's a fucking brilliant and very important comedian, they, they so they tailor-made a show for him. Uh, Billy and yes that is the fucking guy from that uh, nerd show uh, who cares and uh, this show it went nowhere I think it only went six episodes it might have been one season I don't know but that thing died and, and the reason is is because he's just like a, a hypnosis act he needs an audience right like a magic act a hypnosis show he's he can only do his thing if he's got an audience now the problem with that is um, when the audience catches on to the trick, and, and you don't have anything else, like Billy Connolly, you don't have uh, any substance, you don't have any creative, uh, real creative work, you don't have any craftsmanship, you haven't crafted anything but this one gimmick, uh, this magic trick, well, then things are gonna go very, very badly for you. His magic act uh, eventually starts to wear out. Um, so he, this is about 2012, uh, 2012, 2013, um, and let me tell you something, uh, if you, if you're Billy Connolly and you have a show in Blackpool, and you're having a show with all those boomers, I mean, that is prime audience for him, uh, those people are drunk anyway, and so they'll laugh at anything, they're the perfect audience for your trick, where you make a tone of voice and beats, and then shout, and then they will just laugh anyway, people started walking out, like it was getting bad, um, people were walking out, allegedly heckling him, and Connolly himself, being, you know, pussy like most stand-up comedians, he he got angry and had a little hissy fit, and because he's important, and he's a sir, and uh, fucking would, and then just walked out, walked out on the shows, and he did that two or three times. Uh, this is after, like, articles were starting to be written, like, what happened to Billy Connolly? Um, what went wrong? Has he lost it? You know, this is somebody with importance in British culture, so that's pretty significant. Um, so fine that's I think what happened is the audience was now first of all you can't just go you say fuck anymore because that's been done to death by 2013 um, you can't I don't think the hypnotic trick works anymore maybe the subliminal suggestion and the aura of a very important cultural person is getting lost uh, this is also the time where he started being wealthy and explaining that he was an upper class wealthy uh, you know, British elite who was who had moved, graduated to the USA. So then here's where this guy fucking lies again. He he think before when he had the uh, the gay sex things that he would right do the, the actually he was the victim of a terrible trauma. Um, and then I think he figured out that worked really well, so he did another one. Uh, some people say this is based on a, a joke. Parkinson, Parkinson's was the. A popular TV show, and you could say it kind of launched him. I think he was one of the most. What, what did you have in the U.S.? You had um, Merv, you had Merv, and you had uh, Carson and Letterman, and they had Parkinson. And Conley would routinely be on Parkinson, and he had made quips before, like, "I was on Parkinson so many times that I got Parkinson's." And I think this is what happens. He ties that in, and lo and behold, and after the articles of he's done. Um, he's a bore, his audiences are leaving, 
uh, lo and behold, it's announced that he's going to have to quit stand-up because he has Parkinson's. He's got he's been diagnosed with Parkinson's. Well, guess what? Um, nobody ever saw any diagnosis. Uh, but even more suspiciously, he would not do any Parkinson's events. Like you'd expect that, right? They go like um, invite him to, you know, host the you know raise money for Parkinson's. Uh, come in, you know, or come and cheer up people with Parkinson's. Nope, he won't do it. And then he gave this uh, story like, what I've decided is that it it only makes it worse if I focus on the Parkinson's. Uh, so I don't I don't do these type of events, and I don't even think it's good for them. You know, we should just try to move on with our life. Well, that's right, because you're you're a fake. You don't have Parkinson's, and I've suspected this for a long time. However, having seen now interviews with him, so he would have been about 69, 68, 69, let's say 70 about then. Um, he's now 80 years old, and they do interviews with him. Um, he is now a fruity, I mean, I guess now he can finally really be his true gay self. He's a fruity elite uh, 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 artiste. You know, he's not even an artist. He's an artiste with special artworks and showings and fruity French galleries, and he's starting to dress like a fruit now. And the thing is... Um, when they interview him, he has no signs of Parkinson's disease. They will make a big wave of laughter, and it'll slowly die down. And two-thirds of the way through the die down, you'll get used to this. You step into it like a surfer, and you start talking. Before they've stopped laughing, you start talking. And, and it makes another wave, and up you go. And so you surf together. And now he's an 80-year-old man, and he's actually in quite good condition, quite good shape, speaks well. I mean, at 80 years old, people are almost all somewhat slowed down, but he's fine. And there, this is impossible. You don't go 10, 12 years later, and you show no signs of the Parkinson's? Really? No, he lied about that the entire time. So he's a fucking asshole. It's a big magic trick. Uh, it's misattributed importance. It is subliminal suggestion because, you know, Billy Connolly is fucking brilliant. And another thing is, uh, he is a fucking asshole. Like, not just for being a liar, but he's lying about really serious things that, like, would fucking ruin people's lives. And he lied about them just to get out of some, I don't know, social embarrassment. Yeah, we have a self-laugher, we have a joke thief, we have a, a dull a dull set on text that's all about shouting at people in a, in a certain accent that's a big magic trick, and for thinking that you deserve the importance that you got, and for a list of all kinds of reasons, uh, including uh, pretending that somebody molested you uh, to, get, uh, to escape from having to answer about uh, fucking weird shit you were doing, and... Uh, for pretending that you have Parkinson's because you, you, people in the audience is caught on to your fucking magic trick. For all these reasons, fuck you, Billy Conley. Fuck you. But to you, Des McLean, thank you and God bless you for 14 years of making me fucking laugh fucking every laugh time I see this. i you, you madman. There's Brian Ferry. From Roxy Music, and look, he, he's giving a wee, he's giving a backy to, to the guy from Planet of the Apes, Richard Clayderman, a brilliant man. Sincere. Like, and then if you if you look at the Hackney Taxi, that's Princess Diana's body that's in that, and her last request, she wanted to follow a thousand motorcycles. There you go, you have, there's the Elton John in the back, a fucking madman. He gets everywhere. Brilliant. And would you look at that there? There's Barry White. He died last year, but he's still on a motorcycle. Isn't he such a fat man?